I remember uh, he made an appearance at a, uh, a LACMA exhibit, and it was all dedicated to David Hockney, and he, he just stood outside and screamed for 45 minutes, David Hockney can David sock me. Um, we don't even know what it means, but it was offensive, you know, we can agree. Um, he used to go to dinner parties, and when there was another artist there, he would uh, talk to uh, the wait staff or catering staff and try to get their food switched with an inedible object. It was always very awkward. He was very confrontational, and that made him sensational. I'm Dr. Zora Alam, and welcome to American Legacy. Our next documentary is from Academy Award-winning director Warner Hernia. Warner is, of course, known for intimate profiles of great figures, including his on-camera interview with the legendary artist Banksy. We would like to present that on-camera interview tonight. Unfortunately, we couldn't afford the rights to that documentary, so instead, we are showing one of Warner's earlier works, Thomas, about artist Ricardo Thomas, known for his works in audioscapes, photography, painting, collage, video, performance art, and occasionally body hair. Here, now, is the life story of artist Ricardo Thomas. Let me tell you about Tomas. Fellow artist. A creator. Nouveau. Dark. Robin Hood. An enigma. Underground. A defender. Brilliance. Gecko. But overrated. He's a crazy person. Twisted. Gecko. Cheating. Chaotic. Grifter. Disturbing. Jello. I think he is the creator of modern art as we know it. Who is Ricardo Tomas? Where is Ricardo Tomas? Why is Ricardo Tomas? Ricardo Tomas, the visionary and controversial artist, grew up behind the Iron Curtain in Kozep Dunantul to a poor Hungarian father and a Spanish refugee mother, fleeing the oppressive Franco regime. Uh, Ricardo Tomas did grow up behind the Iron Curtain, uh, which is an interesting thing uh, for somebody uh, who, who speaks with such an accent that nobody could possibly understand. Um, it, it's hard to pinpoint where he's from. We closed the gap in the art race and we discovered the soul and sex of American art. Ricardo, I'm not sure if that voice was uh, French, Russian, German, uh, or fake, but regardless, I thought it was excellent. But we were able to uncover documents that he was behind the Iron Curtain. Tomas understood that a destiny of success relied in being blessed with great fortune, essentially being born rich. Therefore, Tomas converted in his ecclesiastical faith to become born again rich. Tomas's plans came true in a most heartbroken fashion when his mother and father were killed in a robbery gone wrong. This occurrence traumatized the 16-year-old artist, but also afforded him a sizable life insurance policy, which allowed him to travel the finest art schools and distilleries of Europe. Yeah, it, it really was uncomfortable how much he liked talking about his parents dying. And, and not in the way that you, you kind of understand someone's going through something and you need to listen to their story. No, he was excited to tell people about it. He could not wait to tell people about it. Uh, I think he personally enjoyed it. Um, he, might, he might make it seem like it's tragic, but he was really into Batman as a kid, so he kind of saw it like as his own sort of Bruce Wayne story and, and a way for him to, to enter the public dialogue. So while tragic and, and horrible as it was, he really liked talking about that story a lot. What is my opinion on Ricardo Tomas and his several art schools? Well, the reason why he went to several art schools is because he kept getting kicked out of all of those art schools. He went to one, he'd act a fool, he would get kicked out, he'd have the money to go to another one, okay? I went to one art school, and my parents paid for it because they had the decency to not die. Tragically true, his temperament and discontentful attitude led to his frequent expulsion. His only stable connection during this tumultuous period was a sock puppet named Andy. This continued until his final portfolio review at the prestigious Collège Royal d'Art in Paris, France, often referred to as the Hogwarts of the art world. 
Luckily, the portfolio review was being prospected by Los Angeles gallerist Jackson Ockroyd Ignatius. Hard Joy Art Gallery. We feature um, the works of prominent artists, eccentric artists, and we specialize in fecal art. It's interesting you ask because I was actually at the incident and witnessed um, the seeds of Ricardo's uh, destruction. Um, it was the final critique for all the students working that year. The art piece that he provided for his final performance review was called Pickle a Dickle. And it's not what you think. Because when all the dicks came in, everyone was like, whoa, are they supposed to be green? But they weren't. That was odd. And then I just started. You know, I just, it was so meaningful. There's nothing more special than watching 50 people being bathed in pickle juice in the moonlight in Paris. Tamaz left Paris when the 50 pickled participants pursued compensation for their participation in his artistic piece. Tamaz said he would procure their payment from his room and then escaped out the back window. Based on the conversation with Ignatius, Tamaz spent his last remaining profits on a one-way ticket to Los Angeles in hopes of gaining representation from the gallery. When I met with him in my art gallery in Los Angeles, I found his, his art was very traditional. I said, what, did this guy actually go to school? Did this guy actually study? Because it was basic. It didn't bring me joy. It didn't bring me hard joy. It was soft joy. Very flaccid work. With no representation and no hopes for legal employment, Tomasi's only refuge was his small rental car. However, rather than risk damaging his artwork, he stored his art in the rental car, while he himself slept under it. Uh, Ricardo Tomas sleeping in his car. Yes, that did happen. And that worked fine before the tow truck came in and severed his finger, which sold at auction for $2 million. Tomas was playing into the story. Tomas did live in his car for about a week, uh, and then he lived at a Wendy's. Uh, Wendy was actually his sugar mama. He lived in a mansion in Orange County, and it was, uh, it, it was a good experience for him because it also let him be in the world he was known to, to be around, which is being surrounded by obscenely rich people. And by the way, did we mention that uh, Wendy is 82 years old? I don't know personally what happened behind closed doors with um, Tomas and Wendy, uh, but the neighbors did report uh, a lot of loud noises, a lot of barking, a lot of growling, a lot of rough, 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 uh, hold on, let me pull up the, the transcript here. Rough, 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 no, don't spank me there. Rough, rough, can Doggy get his treat? Now, one of his neighbors across the, the street did report that Wendy used to walk him around on a leash throughout the neighborhood. So this, this is where I grapple with the truth of what's going on because I don't fully understand whether this was like a, like a fetish thing or whether Tomas had convinced this woman who was not fully there that he was her dog. Again, I don't know what happened behind closed doors, but um, I believe Tomas was willing to do anything, anything to stay in the LA art scene. Tomas was rejected by all the major Los Angeles galleries, including Hauser and Worth and Gagosian. But one gallery was willing to represent him, Julius W. Hungadunga of Hungadunga, 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 Hungadunga and McCormick. Uh, until he finally gets an interview with, uh, of course, Julius Hungadunga. Um, and in that interview, uh, it, it goes down in legend. Um, Ricardo was not speaking a lot of English uh, at the time, and, and Julius uh, communicated him with a, a, a series of, of hand gestures, um, drawings, and of course obscene sock puppets. Um, so that's how uh, Ricardo signed on to the gallery. Um, we have no idea if he understood what he was signing or not. And to be quite honest, it seems to me like he's the kind of man that would just accept anybody in his art gallery except me. Well, the reason why I would talk to Julius Hungadunga because he has such a reputation in the art world is because he has a reputation in the art world, because he can get art seen. 
I mean, he is a lying, manipulative, cheating, no good dirtbag. But he's a lying, cheating, manipulative, no good dirtbag that can help me. Hunga Dunga was somebody who was able to get Tomas into all these galleries, into even the larger places like the uh, the Huntington, uh, LACMA, um, uh, even into the Getty uh, at a certain point. I, I, I think there was a, a, a resentment for sure. Hunga Dunga was definitely stealing money from Tomas. And Tomas was frustrated that he couldn't just walk in the place, put an art piece up there, and then walk out of the door with a, a sack full of cash as if he, this were a, a cartoon or a bank robbery. As you know, I have been a fervent follower of Ricardo Tomas for a long time. Like, I'm not currently doing it. I'm not, I don't even know where he is, frankly. I know that I need to keep 300 yards away from wherever that is. Uh, and that's just another six months. Uh, but I was, I did have the opportunity to be at the gallery uh, when his star was launched. That Hunga Dunga put together this solo art show for Tomas, and he shocked the world with his work. Oh, I was there, and let me tell you what happened. Every foreign dignitary had been invited, a lot of celebrities, pop stars, um, all of the Kardashians, most of the major holders of cryptocurrency. Tomas sold a painting. It's not good enough for Tomas, which is baffling. So Hunga Dunga pulls him away. He's like, let the sale happen. Tomas is like, no, no, no. Was he drunk? Yes. So Tomas takes a swing at Hunga Dunga. Uh, he misses. Hunga Dunga takes a swing back. He obviously hits. And then Tomas starts fighting. Ricardo just did it for the shock. And what happens next, I really couldn't believe. So not only are these two fighting uh, terribly, but a couple of the other artists around there think it's part of the installation. So they start fighting. And then like all the people at the gallery think that they're part of the art show too, and that this is some big expression on cacophony. And people were clapping and applauding it. So they all get in a brawl. Uh, to quote Tomas in this, no one was paying attention to a hairy Hungarian, um, which, I mean, we were. That's when the ax came out. He did start swinging, um, not only at people, but uh, at, at sculptures, at art. I don't understand how this man, he endangered people's lives. He lights the place on fire. So there's a couple like paintings worth millions just on fire, completely lit up, sculptures going in flames. It's almost like it happens in slow motion. It just burns on down and then <laughs> This place is burning up. The only thing that survives in this very moment is Tomas's painting. And so the, ultimately the buyer says, I have to have this because this is the only thing that survived. I will buy it for $15 million. Tomas says, yes, done. He's, he managed to get what he wanted. And um, Elon Musk passed out. Luckily, $15 million was enough to cover the damage to the burnt out building. Tomasi's remaining work was scooped up by Pietro Ezra Nazos, a Greek shipping magnet. Nazos immediately financed an international art tour for Tomas, allowing the artist to create, speak, and promote himself. This was to ensure that the price of Tomasi's work would remain astronomically high. Nazos was so protective of his investment in Tomas that he purchased one painting for a record-breaking $26 million. Yeah, $26 million? Yeah. I missed the boat on that one. Man, I got really got to work on my relationship with Tomas. I think I burned it, but I'm uh, working on working my way back inside of him. $26 million. So my editor says, uh, we sell a lot of magazines. We sell a lot. We get a lot of clicks with this Tomas guy. You got to cover him. I didn't want to. I almost died in that fire. Now well-known and world-famous, Tomas invited to accompany on his tour the people most supportive in his life, including his best friend, Andy. Um, there were was, there was some deep conversations between the two, and I think that Andy was somebody who would listen to Tomas and Tomas felt comfortable around Andy. Um, 
I don't really know how far that level of intimacy went. Um, I, I at first thought they were friends, but there were many times that they left closets, bathrooms, uh, gardens, uh, and they would both be adjusting their clothes at the exact same time. However, as the pressure of the tour increased, Tomasi's behavior became more erratic. Because he would often stop and give lines to Andy. There's an old saying that goes, every great climber will lose his favorite toe. So we were in Mykonos, um, lovely place to be. And Tomas, for, I, I want to say that he thought that he was either at an art installation or that this moment would be something that would be considered its own installation. Much in the way that, you know, when Tom Green would go on the street and it would be considered a piece of art when he'd plank. I think Tomas thought this would be one of those moments except it was in private and there were a handful of us to see it. What Tomas did was he lit a cigar and he put it in his rectum. He seemed unfazed by it. He left it there for a while, uh, which makes me think that this wasn't the first time that uh, Tomas had done this. I think he'd been practicing all week on that, which is, you know, kudos to him for his commitment, but I would hate to be his proctologist. Of course he had to go to the hospital after it went off. I mean, he burnt his butthole. Hospitalized in Greece, Tomas had suffered a complete dissociation with reality. Fans of the artist left him. His closest friends, including Andy, couldn't stand by his side anymore. He described himself as, as God's lonely man. Um, to no one, because he didn't have any friends at that point. Having nowhere to go and no one to turn to, Tomás voluntarily entered the Pablo Picasso Rehab Center in Malibu, California, designed to rehabilitate people from drinking and from being a massive asshole. Bills rose while the value of his artwork fell, causing Nazos and Julius to publicly criticize him. Tomás, in turn, denounced the pair as capitalist swine that he would rather... Actually, we can't repeat that on television. Tomas is gonna do this whole show, this Life of the Phoenix, this big gallery opening, and he is expecting a huge, huge crowd. Eh. I was very excited to attend the press conference where Ricardo actually announced uh, his next project, The Life of the Phoenix, um, to reinvigorate his, uh, his fine art career. Um, suddenly a shot rang out and he dropped. Everyone looked. Andy was holding the gun. Um, because of uh, our familiarity of Ricardo's work, we assumed that it was a bit, and we, you know, we laughed and like clapped a little bit. Um, and we waited for him to get up for an uncomfortable amount of time, like not as uncomfortable as it was for him, you know, because he'd been shot. But um, as, the, as the pool of blood grew, we thought something might be wrong. It was terrible days um, in the days following the shooting. Ricardo was in a coma. Information started circulating that perhaps Julius Hungadunga had actually paid Andy off. Theories abounded. Uh, who was Andy really? What did Julius have to gain? Was it personal? Was it professional? Um, and most importantly, who sold Andy a gun? The FBI found a money trail leading back from Andy to Hungadunga, who was promptly arrested for conspiracy and attempted murder. Nazos refused to testify. His priceless collection of Tomas originals disappeared from the public eye. Tomas went on to live a quiet life after recovery and even reconciled with Andy to, as he put it, find peace within his soul. I think the lasting legacy of Ricardo Tomas is no matter how much you mess up, no matter how much you get away with, no matter how much you do wrong, that there is hope that you can change, that you can learn and you can grow. And I think that that offers people hope. Can you actually, can you help me up? I think my water just broke. 